The Association of the U.S. Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series, a new webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan. Well, good morning or good afternoon to everybody and uh, welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar. Thank you for joining us today. And while we wish we could all be together here at AUSA, that's simply not possible in today's environment. So what we've done is we've crafted a series of events to bring you senior Army leaders, authors, and other personalities speaking on issues of current interest to America's Army, all in a live and interactive forum. We're very glad you've joined us today and we appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our great nation. We're pleased to have a tremendous speaker with us today. He's a prolific writer on all things related to World War II and a familiar face to those who follow World War II documentaries on television and especially those produced by the BBC. Mr. James Holland is here today to discuss his new book entitled Sicily 43, The First Assault on Fortress Europe. To moderate the discussion, we're also joined by our, our good friend, Lieutenant General Retired Ted Stroop, Senior Fellow here at the Association of the United States Army. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to General Stroop to get us started. Ted, over to you. here on your thought leader and it's an absolutely uh, honor for me to be with the distinguished historian James Holland. Uh, as an aside, James, you may not know this, but I have most of your books <laughs> on my bookshelf. Never knew him that we'd be meeting someday uh, in a webinar. Uh, uh, as Joe Swan mentioned, our Lecturer today is a prolific author, uh, Normandy 44, uh, The Big Week, uh, Rise of Germany, and the Allies Strike Back in the West. A uh, uh, fascinating trilogy, uh, Fortress Malta, uh, The Dam Busters, and The Battle of Britain. Uh, and as was already mentioned, uh, he is on a TV series, a tele series, and has a weekly World War II podcast. Uh, we have ways of making you think. It's now is now heard on uh, Little Hit Hip Bub Radio. Um, thank you for participating. Uh, it'd be nice to be with you uh, on that side of the Atlantic. And but the, this technology is uh, great and it allows us to have great folks like you participating. So, so uh, James, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you and. Uh, you can tell us about not only this book, but your rationale for the whole series that you have started. Well, thank you, General, and thank you for, uh, for, for tuning in. Um, yeah, I mean, technology is a wonderful thing. I always really enjoy coming over to the US. Um, I'm usually over there at least kind of once a year, and it's always great to go around and, um, and meet people and see people face to face. But um, in this current climate, this is the second best. And um, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful to being invited on. So thank you all very much. It's a, it's a singular honor. So uh, I mean, I, I went to Sicily because um, I turned to Sicily. I'd, I'd done Normandy, as you rightly pointed out, General. And um, I sort of probably did them out of sequence. Really, I should have done Sicily first because there's so many lessons from Sicily were taken over into Normandy just under a year later. But I'd been traveling around. I'd actually spent a bit of time there. Uh, but funny enough, I, I I wrote a novel set in um, Sicily some years ago. I had a, a series um, following the adventures of an English British rifleman, a Tommy in the Second World War, and he, he sort of he basically sort of gets absolutely everywhere. And the last one I did was set in Sicily, so I did quite a lot of research there, and I'd also walked quite a lot of the ground. Um, and then I went over with the British Army. You know, we do battlefield studies, as I know you guys do as well in the U.S. Army. And um, it was it's fascinating going with with um, with soldiers because a lot of them have seen service, as I know you guys have in in Iraq and in, um, in uh, Afghanistan and, and elsewhere. Uh, and so getting their perspective from people who've actually been in action, have been in combat. 
um, on the ground in a World War II battlefield is always really, really interesting. And one of the things that struck me about, about Sicily is it's just such an amazing story. I mean, you know, it's got special forces. It's got Paddy Main and the SAS. It's got paratroopers. It's got it's got General Gavin or Colonel as he was then, you know, one of the legends of the 82nd Airborne. Um, it's got mad Germans um uh, wearing kilts and claymores like uh, Ernst Gunter Bader it's got one of the one of the great field generals of the, of the war in the German army uh Valentin Huber known as the man the man um it's got mountains uh, with precipitous kind of um cliff top towns that have to be prized from a determined enemy it's got malaria infested plains it's got the mafia kind of bubbling underneath it's got Patton and Monty, for goodness sake. I mean, what more could you ask for? It's got air battles, sizzling air battles, incredible naval actions, um, uh, as well as the ground battle as well. Um, and it sees that it's a period in which we see the end of Mussolini, the end of fascism in, in Italy, the total collapse of that um, Axis alliance between Nazi Germany and, and Italy. Um, and it's the first time Allied troops, Western Allied troops, get a foothold in Europe again, back into fortress Europe. So on one level, it's kind of what's not to like. I mean, this is just an amazing story and, and it's an island and it's got, you know, the campaign on the island itself lasts for 38 days. So it's kind of a very neat tale to tell. And yet, because I guess because of Hollywood and, you know, it's not Band of Brothers and it's not Saving Private Ryan and it's not Fury and a movie hasn't been made about it very recently. Um, it's kind of off the radar, which is why the last major book, um, narrative history written about the Sicilian campaign was Carlo Deste, legendary um, American author and ex-serviceman himself, um, back in 1988. I mean, <laughs> that's a long time ago. Um, that's well over 30 years. So it kind of felt like it was the time was ripe to re-examine Sicily. I mean, I should also say that that I have a little bit of a different take on the traditional view on World War II. And I think Sicily very, very firmly falls into that kind of traditional camp, which is sort of slightly down on the Allied effort, exacerbating notions of Anglophobia on the part of American senior commanders, um, Americophobia on the part of British senior commanders, that they're kind of constantly at kind of loggerheads over things, um, that we were too stodgy, too slow, you know, lacking that kind of tactical chutzpah of panzer races like Michael Wittmann um, uh, uh, and, and sort of tactically sharp German generals. Um, and, and there's a sort of downer on the naval effort. There's a downer on the on the Air Force effort. Uh, and there's a downer on the kind of sort of generally on the, on the kind of allied effort as a whole. I mean, if, once you go into Normandy, yes, D-Day was a great achievement. But then there is a general feeling that, again, that kind of campaign that went into uh, the winter of 1944 and into 1945 was just a bit too slow, a bit too stodgy, a bit too predictable, you know, lacking flair, lacking drive. And, and I would dispute all that. And I think it's really important to understand that, that the way the narrative of World War II has been told over the last kind of 40, 50 years is really on only two of the three levels of war. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure I'm kind of teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs when I explain this, because I'm sure everyone in the audience kind of knows exactly what I'm talking about. But the three levels of war are the strategic, operational and tactical. Uh, and just for those, in case there isn't someone who knows what I mean by that, um, the strategic obviously is in, in very simple form is, is the overview. This is what you're trying to do, you know, get to Berlin, get rid of Hitler um, and, and the Nazis. Or in the case of Germany, you know, try and cross the English Channel and conquer Britain in 1940. That's your strategic level. It's the, it's the high end stuff. It's the high command stuff. Then you've got the tactical, which is the kinetic bit. That's the kind of that's the coal face of war. That's um, your crew in their Sherman tank, um, the B-17 bomber, uh, the pilot in his Spitfire, the infantry going forward. It's, it's the artillery. It's, it's the actual clash of arms on the battlefield. That's your tactical level. But then you've got the operational level. And this is, in its simplest form, the nuts and bolts. This is, you know, this is uh, um, factories and um, economics and supply chains and um, trucks and fuel and, and Hershey bars and camel cigarettes. And in the case of the Brits, plenty of tea uh, um, and, and, and spam and all the rest of it. So it's the supply lines and it's, and it's how people connect. It's The operational level is how the tactical level and the strategic level are linked together. 
and it's how you can achieve it's how nations achieve their strategic ends with their tactical means and once you start reinserting the operational level into the narrative a quite different picture emerges it's basically how people fight wars and different combat combating nations in world war ii do fight in a different way because they have a whole different set of constraints from one another or um in you know they have different kinds of access so america has to get across the pacific it has to get across the atlantic that means that fundamentally sea power is absolutely the heart of everything that the united states is doing and ditto great britain whereas that's not the case for the ussr and it's not the case for germany in quite the same way it should be the case for germany because actually the number one um theater of the war for nazi germany is clearly the atlantic but they don't treat it as such and, and that leads us to kind of sort of how people are fighting in the Mediterranean in the middle of 1943. I think when we look at, uh, and certainly Carlo Deste, you know, I, I, he is a brilliant um, historian whom I respect enormously, but we are coming at it from slightly different perspectives. And, you know, he, he is quite critical of the plans. He's quite critical of the slowness of the advance. And he's also quite critical of the fact that a number of Germans managed to get away at the end of that 38 day campaign. And, and, and I would sort of question that judgment um, I think the planning was pretty good, actually. You know, it was conducted while they were still carrying out the Tunisia campaign. The final plan was agreed on the 2nd of May, 1943. You know, the end in Tunisia didn't happen until the 13th of May, 1943. Um, in terms of the stodginess, um, well, uh, we'll go on to that in a minute, if I may. I'll just hold that and ditto with the, uh, with the evacuation of the Germans at the end of the war. I think there has also been this kind of, you know, this, this real relish um, by historians, particularly historians who've got a, a kind of sort of journalistic background, that to kind of accentuate the discord between the Allied high commanders. Uh, and that's where you get your kind of sort of notions of Anglophobia and Americophobia kind of creeping in. But I think what is actually remarkable is just how well they all get on. Uh, and what I would what I would I, I would say is is don't be too um don't be too misled by a pithy one-liner in a diary. You have to remember that these senior commanders have gargantuan amounts of responsibility on their shoulders. You know, we've all been in situations in the workplace, um, maybe in your time in the army, maybe in, in the front line, uh, maybe just at home over the kitchen table, where you have felt really, really strongly about something and you argue the toss. You, you know, you, you feel that whoever is arguing against you is wrong and you're gonna say your piece. Well, just imagine accentuating that times a thousand because, you know, the decisions you're making, um, young men's lives are at stake. You know, this is really important stuff. So inevitably, people are going to get a bit heated at times. But that doesn't mean to say you're not getting on. And it doesn't mean to say you're not going to be best of mates by the following Tuesday. And so I think these diary entries, you have to see them in their wider context. You have to accept that this is an outlet for people with huge amounts of responsibility. At the end of the day, they can they can sort of offload a little bit. It's, it's the email that you write, but shouldn't send for 48 hours. It, it's that kind of thing. This this is their kind of sort of psychiatrist chair for these guys, sort of getting a little bit off, off, off their chest. I think what is remarkable about the allies in the West and, and of course, I'm particularly talking about, about the UK and, and the USA, is just how well they get on in the Second World War. You know, it is that spirit of cooperation, coordination, collaboration, coalition, that, that really, that, that one united goal that really sees them uh, um, kind of seize the war and, and, and win the war in the West so convincingly so, and so effectively with comparatively um, low loss of life compared to the other major combatants. And I'm talking, of course, you know, Japan, China, um, USSR and Germany, particularly, you know, compared to them. And that's because of the whole allied strategy, whole way of war, which is starting to evolve and really kind of uh, bear the fruits by 1943 and particularly on Sicily. And this is, of course, the, 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 the theory of steel, not flesh. This idea that you use modernity, technology, vast global reach, uh, industry, uh, um, mechanization to do a lot of your hard yards so that the number of people in the firing line are kept to an absolute minimum. That's why you've got kind of 300 divisions on the Eastern Front, because the Germans and the Soviet Union aren't particularly efficient fighters of war. Whereas, you know, the United States never gets above, I think, 90 divisions and, and the British Army never gets above 55. And yet both of nations obviously play an absolutely crucial part in the Second World War and World War II in, in its outcome, whatever the theatre is. And this is absolutely applied to, to, to Sicily. And I think Sicily is a, is a real tipping point. They're starting to sort of work out how to, how to work. I mean, 
Field Marshal Alexander, who is overall uh, our land commander for Sicily, you know, he says, says modern warfare is a brotherhood of air, land and sea. Well, it certainly isn't for Nazi Germany and it certainly isn't for the Soviet Union, but it absolutely is for the United States and it absolutely is for Britain. And you see this when you're doing a kind of a major amphibious operation like Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, in July 1943. That is, that is just such a monstrously big, gargantuan logistical challenge. Uh, and you can only pull something off like uh, um, something like that off if you are really kind of working your navy and your air forces and, and, and land forces together. So to specifically fo focus on the U.S. Uh, the United States Army, I mean, I think it's really, really interesting. You know, a lot of the a lot of the disgruntlement about Sicily um, starts with the notion that 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 somehow. U.S. 7th Army is playing second fiddle to 8th Army, that the sort of cocky, hot-headed Monty is kind of sort of thinks he knows it all and, um, you know, and is trying to belittle the Americans. Um, and I don't think that, I simply don't think that is the case at all. Um, and I think what is really interesting is, is you have to remember not to judge the Americans of the July 1943 through the prism of what they become by the beginning of 1945, which is the world's best armed forces bar none. You know, absolutely end off. But in July 1943, they're still feeling their way. You know, it's kind of ground zero for the US Army in, in, in May, June 1940, when the strategic earthquake uh, of the fall of France happens. You know, France is a, is, is a superpower by kind of modern uh, standing. And it's collapsed in six weeks. And, and this is the big strategic earthquake. And this is why President Roosevelt suddenly goes, yikes, you know, we need to kind of massively up our game. We need to kind of put billions into defense. We need to kind of, you know, forget kind of a handful of thousand of aircraft every year. We need to be building 50,000 instead of a kind of, a, you know, a standing army of 189,000, which is what it is in September 1939. We need to have millions, you know, but that doesn't, you know, you can click your fingers, but, but it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes time to kind of work everyone up, to work up, to build the machine tools to build the factories to convert automobile manufacturers to aircraft manufacturers and tank manufacturers and all the rest of it you know it, it, it's a slow process and yet what is amazing is just how quick the USA grips this and converts it I mean there's a wonderful photograph of, of Sherman tanks being loading onto landing ships and landing ships I mean what an amazing invention that is uh, um, in Berserta in the port of Tunisia ready for Operation Husky the invasion of Sicily and, and it's just mind blowing if you think that kind of three years before that, that you know, the US Army is that by July 1943, it's that. But you still have to remember that the previous campaign in Tunisia has only involved one corps of the US Army. You know, that is two corps, variously commanded by Friedendahl, by Patton, by Bradley. Uh, uh, but it is one corps and a part of British First Army. So, so there is, it, there is, it's perfectly obvious that you would make Eighth Army, which is the f considerably greater experience of battle and operating as an army, would take the lead in the invasion of Sicily. Geographically, it makes sense as well because most of Eighth Army is coming from Egypt, which is on the eastern side of Sicily, and and most of the American Army, Seventh Army, which only becomes Seventh Army at midnight on the 9th and 10th of July, i.e. D-Day for Operation Husky, um, is coming from the western side of Tunisia. So obviously they're going to come on the western side of of uh, of Sicily. It's exactly the same with Normandy. You know, the U.S. forces in the southwest of England. So you come straight across the English Channel and land on the western side of Normandy. British forces are in the southeast of England, so they come on the eastern side of Normandy. It's the same same principle. But there is this experience thing. And, and and if the British are a little bit wary of the Americans, that's because the Americans haven't at that stage in the war fielded a full field army at that point. There have been divisions and operations in Guadalcanal and the Philippines and all the rest of it. But but 7th Army is the first American army to be fielded as an army. So in other words, don't judge Patton as he is on the as midnight strikes and, and 7th Army becomes reality on the 9th and 10th of July 1943. Don't judge him by what he is by the end of 1945. You have to judge him by what he is then. And the truth of the matter is, the US Army is not very experienced at, at, at fighting battles on the land. Now, what is really interesting is that very quickly, they man up big time, because quite a concentrated, quite a, a, a big 
counterattack is made, a joint, it's not very well co coordinated, thankfully, but, but a joint German-Italian counterattack is launched against the main American invasion at Jella, which is in the central southern part of Sicily. And I think we do have a map here, so you can see the kind of distances and you can see kind of roughly where. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the first map uh, and you can see the huge distances they've got to come and what a massive operation it is. And, and you can see there Jella in the sort of south east central southern part between Licata and and Avila that's where the Americans are landing and if we just very quickly have the next map um you can see a bit more specifically yeah okay so there you can see where the Americans are landing so okay we can do with the maps now you've, you've uh, hopefully everyone's sort of got a got a got a feel of where everything is but but they see off that counterattack very effectively and one of the things that's so good about the counterattack is not only the bullishness of the troops on the ground and and the and the uh, immense courage, which is absolutely without question. Uh, um, you know, they fight very heroically. It's also that logistic chain. It's also that operational level. In very rough seas, it hastened to be added. You know, they absolutely deliver with bells on. Yes, there are problems with the parachute drop, and and that's a whole separate issue. But overall, it's really really impressive. Uh, and within five days, 203,204 American troops have been landed on Sicily. I mean, that's a heck of a lot. And what then happens is Patton gets permission from Alexander to clear the western part of the island. So what's happening is the Germans are, the, the, the Italians start to melt away. The Germans start to kind of regain their balance. They kind of discount the kind of the Italian effort because they don't think they're up to much cop. And, and they're, frankly, they're right. They start organizing a defensive line to try and hold that northeast corner of Sicily as quickly, as, as effectively and for as long as possible. That's the German aim. So the Americans have this uh, opportunity to clear the western part of, of Sicily. Uh, and it begins on the uh, on the 19th of July and is all over pretty much by the shooting uh, by the 22nd and completely by the 23rd of July. So basically kind of five days. And while the opposition is not significant, as an opportunity to test your metal, to test your logistic supply chains, it is an absolutely brilliantly conducted operation of war. Uh, and what it shows is that the Americans are absolutely ready, that they've done their time, they've learned the lessons of Tunisia, they've really got their act together, and they are a serious force to be reckoned. So that when they then turn back uh, and are able to kind of slot in alongside 8th Army and the Canadians uh, on attacking towards that north wet, northeast corner of, of, of Sicily and in that central northern section of, of Sicily, the British are going, hallelujah, fan fantastic. You know, you've done amazingly. Yes, please, come on in. Uh, um, we're only too happy. Um, you know, they then have some pretty tough battles. San Fratello, Troina. Troina is, is an is a absolute classic of mountain attritional slogging warfare, which is going to mark the warfare that they then subsequently face in, in Italy in the months and, and uh, the next few months to a year that will follow. But in Sicily... I think you can see that the US Army really comes of age. And I'd also like to mention, just my last point before we go over to questions, I'd also like to say that, of course, at that point, it is the United States Army Air Force. So I'm going to include the Air Force in this as well, because the US Air Force, uh, US Army Air Force in 1943 also is coming of age. And actually, although the number of troops is fewer than the number of British troops on the ground, actually, the number of aircraft is, is pipping those of the RAF. Uh, and the air power, the, the, that, that understanding of, of working air power and working strategic air power, tactical air power as well, close air support, boy, it's impressive. I mean, it really is. And if you really want, and there's one statistic, a couple of statistics I just want to very, very quickly give you, which is over, so over Tunisia, the Luftwaffe alone, not just the Regia Aeronautica, which is the Italian Air Force, the Luftwaffe alone loses 2,600 aircraft. In the summer months, of 1943, between June and uh, the end of September 1943, the Luftwaffe loses 3,504 aircraft. So that is a total of 6,000 aircraft lost. In the same period, they lose 702 on the Eastern Front. 
So those who say the, uh, you know that that the Eastern Front is where it's all at, and the and the Mediterranean was just a sideshow, it depends on which way you're looking at it and on what perspective. But certainly from the point of view of the air power, it absolutely isn't. Uh, and one person who was completely obsessed with the Southern Front was Hitler, but that's a that's a, another story. But but it is really really impressive. And vital lessons are learned on Sicily, which go forward not only into Sicily, but uh, into Italy, but also into Normandy as well. So I hope that's a that's my little introductory bit. Uh, and I'm, I think we're now going to go over to questions, aren't we? Well, we have a number of questions. And uh, uh, I'll go down the list that uh, come in. Some of them are duplicate or main thing. But you give us a uh, great insight in... Uh, the individual soldier's thoughts and his feelings uh, on the battlefield or getting prepped for the battlefield. How did you research this? Did you use archives? Did you do interviews or letters from families? Uh, it's a fascinating amount of detail. The same that I found when I read your Normandy book. Um, uh, yes. So, so I mean, you know, back in the day, I mean, I started work on, on World War II about kind of 20 years ago, and obviously there were a huge number of veterans there and uh, around then, and I spent a huge amount of time uh, traveling the length and breadth of the United States, amongst other parts of the world, talking to veterans. Um, and a number of them that I, uh, I wrote a book about North Africa a while ago. So uh, a lot of guys who were, who fought in two corps in North Africa, subsequently fought in Sicily. So I had quite a lot of, you know, I had a backlist of uh, a backlog of, of interviews that I'd recorded many years ago. Um, but I also spent time in the US um, going to um, the National World War II Museum in, in New Orleans, um, and also at the brilliant United States Army um, Heritage and Education Center in uh, Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania. Um, and there they've got a, an amazing archive and uh, um, very, very impressive staff, incredibly helpful staff. Um, and uh, there's a huge oral history program there. And um, veterans were encouraged to send in memoirs, unpublished memoirs and writings and letters and diaries and what have you. Um, so it's very easy to kind of sort of get it all together. And then, of course, there are a number of published accounts as well. So the, the problem is always kind of... Um, which ones to choose? Because, um, I mean, you know, I had something like, um, I think, kind of 20 different accounts from the big red one, the US First Infantry Division. And it was a question of kind of choosing which ones. And, um, you know, I, I think you kind of work out, you know, wh what, what are your fence posts here? You know, what, what are the big points? OK, so you've got to do the landings, haven't you? You've got to do the, the push going west. You want to kind of have someone from each of the major divisions. Um, and, and you also want to kind of hit the big battles like Troina and, and, and so on. So you, you, your characters that you follow need to be able to illustrate those big moments in the U.S. 7th Army's journey across Sicily. So you kind of sort of choose them like that. But it's... um. You know, getting Brits and Canadians and Americans isn't the problem. The problem is always getting the Germans and the Italians because, you know, unsurprisingly, they were kind of not quite so keen to kind of talk about their experiences as as Americans and Brits were. In your uh, in your research, uh, did you discover how uh, the Germans viewed this Sicily investigation? Clearly, at the time when the Wehrmacht was already in strategically locked in the east. Yeah, well, it was. A, I mean, I mean, Germany and Italy are, are, are both reeling from the absolutely catastrophic defeat in Tunisia. In terms of 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 importance of land, you know, North Africa is is perhaps a little bit questionable, but but in terms of the commitment, I mean, Hitler invested a huge amount in Tunisia, poured troops, tanks, Tiger tanks, uh, um, weaponry, uh, um, shipping, and, and of course the Luftwaffe, of, of course, as well into into North Africa, as did the as did the Italians. And, you know, 250,000 people in the bag at the end of that campaign, that, that's a big hole to try and kind of replicate. So suddenly they're scrabbling around because they know that the Italy's kind of, you know, on the cusp of getting out of the war. So what do you do? Because you've got Italian troops guarding the whole of the Aegean and Greece and all those islands, uh, the Balkans, as well as Italy itself. If Italy gets out of the war, suddenly you've, you've either got to relinquish that ground or you've got to fill it yourself. So they're starting to kind of plan for this, but but they haven't got much time. So the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division had been the 15th Panzer Division in North Africa, but was was completely destroyed. So it's being reformed. Um, and it's, it's a real hodgepodge. The same with, you know, the Hermann Goering Regiment had operated in uh, in Tunisia and also been destroyed. So they're trying to create a division. But but. At the start of the Sicilian campaign, there's only two divisions in Sicily, 
And they are frankly kind of cobbled together with, there is a, a modicum of experience um, and, um, and hardened veterans amongst them, but an awful lot aren't. And this is a big problem. There are, however, a number of divisions that have been moved into southern France and into northern, you know, uh, into northern Italy and Italy itself, ready for for such a, an eventuality, uh, and so those are being primed. I mean, the interesting thing is that Mussolini doesn't want German troops in Sicily. He kind of thinks, no, the way we restore uh, um, um, Italian war effort is by by letting the Italians do the hard yards. Um, sorry, much please. Um, is is by letting the Italians do the hard yards, but with help but with german material um and and this is because he feels he's losing his grip on power uh, which he is so he wants to kind of re-exert himself by using italian forces and having a great victory but of course it's 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 sort of la la land stuff but very quickly i mean one of the things that that leading combat troops seem to assimilate for the most part very effectively in the second world war particularly if you've got half decent leaders and commanders at the top of the chain is you can learn those lessons very quickly so the Hermann Goering division is is pretty hopeless to start off with but but very quickly in a matter of weeks turns itself on its head and becomes a really pretty sharp act and ditto with the 15th panzer grenadier division and then they're reinforced by the first Fauschenjäger division paratroop division plus the um the 29th panzer grenadier division and, and suddenly you've got quite a strong force particularly if and, and actually it might be just worth showing up that map again the second map if it's possible um but you can see um if you remember the map if we can't show that map again oh here we are yeah i mean you can see this this if you look at that kind of northeast corner you can see those defensive lines and you can see how to start off with they're kind of swinging from kind of east to west roughly and then you can see that second east to west line above kind of enna right in the middle from the gulf of catania all the way across the half camlinia then swings up to the north coast at santa stefano and you can see again that the kind of the the, the northeast corner of sicily starts to taper and you've got these successive defensive lines. And of course, as it tapers, so your line is shorter, which means you require less men to defend it, which means it's quite, a, you know, it, that's quite an attractive proposition as a defensive position for the Germans. Uh, and the quality just gets, the quality of the German troops gets better as the campaign progresses. Whilst at the same time, obviously, they're, they're, they're taking the hits as well. Um, but it's a disaster for the, uh, it's a disaster for Germany. Um, and and the, the bottom line is, is Hitler isn't going to give up the Mediterranean, not least because he fears his southern flank and he fears the vulnerability of that, but also because his only single oil source is in Ploesti, which is in Romania, which is at the kind of northern end of the Balkans. So if you give that up, then you're completely dependent on very, very expensive and hard to produce synthetic fuel. And they don't have enough of that anyway. And without oil, you know, you can't move because you can't have any tanks or guns or machinery or whatever so safeguarding Presti is 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 of absolutely vital importance okay we can get rid of the map now i think if you look at this campaign what what insights can be applied today for future allied and coalition operations against uh potential adversaries in the current era of great power competition Thing is something that I've alluded to already, General, which is is closer coordination and cooperation. You know, I think one of the, what, the one of the things that I find very troubling at the moment in the world is that we've become incredibly binary. You know, you're either kind of for Greta Thunberg and kind of being an eco warrior, or you're not. You're either for you're either kind of you know for Trump or you're against him. You're either for Brexit or you're or you're for remaining in Europe. There doesn't seem to be an awful lot of grey areas, and I, and I really do think that one of the reasons why the um, the British and American coalition of World War Two was so incredibly successful, and it really really was, was because of that that one united goal and that single singleness of purpose and that coalition. You know that coordination that kind of sort of making the most of your resources i think you know you can see again during world war ii by and large uh there are obvious exceptions but but by and large the british and the americans really prioritize and use the best of their resources to the best of their advantage you know you don't have sort of squandering projects like sort of v2s which you know rockets which kind of sort of come to nothing you really kind of get them doing the still not flesh policy, this idea of kind of huge mechanization and modernity very effectively. You know, this idea of crushing your enemy 
with a combination of breathtaking numbers and modernity. And I think it's very, very effective. And I think leading the march on that is, of course, the political leaders, uh, Roosevelt and, and Churchill, particularly, uh, but also Eisenhower. And I, I don't think there's any praises too high for uh, Eisenhower in World War II. You know, again, you know, he has a has a slightly difficult time of it in the first winter in New Tunisia, but but he 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 kind of steps up in a very very quick and big way, uh, and what he's a master at is this idea of let's not be chippy, let's not kind of constantly have a, a bit loggerheads, let's work together. I don't want to hear any grouching. I don't want to hear slagging off the Americans. I don't want to hear slagging off the Brits. I want you guys to work together. If you've got a problem, sort it out. You know, there's we've got to work together. And what is amazing about it is it's not a formal alliance. It is only ever a coalition. So there are shared aims, there are shared goals, there are shared principles, and there are occasionally shared weaponry, Sherman tanks, um, six pounder anti-tank guns and so on, um, cavity magnetron, whatever it might be. But there is lots of completely different weaponry as well. Lots of different tactics, shared principles, yes, uh, but it works. Uh, and, and the person who is the glue, certainly in the, in the Western part, is is Eisenhower. And if you want to contrast that, I mean, compare that to MacArthur, who is is completely partisan um, and, and you know, kicks the Australians into touch and doesn't really want anything to do with the Brits and all the rest of it. It's a completely different approach to coalition warfare in the Far East. But in the West, where, you know, you're taking on a, um, you, you know, you're having to invade a pretty large landmass in Europe, um, that coalition is incredibly effective. And I think that is the biggest single lesson we can take going forward at the moment. You know, it's no good arguing endlessly about who's paying for what in NATO. It's like, have a plan and, and, and let's stick to it and let's work together. And I think one of the things that I think is, is different is that politics and, and, and armed services are a separate entity. Uh, and I'm sure you would agree that the that, uh, United States with her coalition and allies, coalition partners and, and, and various military allies, actually at a, at a, um, at a command level, uh, and an armed services level is is still abiding by those principles probably more effectively than than they are politically but i still think there's lessons to be learned from that i think the other big lesson going forward is uh, is that you have to kind of you have to absolutely work together air land and sea um you know i do still think that but the the, uh, the issues that faced the united states and britain you know being across oceans um being being cut adrift from the rest of the European landmass, they still apply. You know, anything that we do is going to have to come from from overseas, from over the water. So I think that coordination of air, land, and sea is still absolutely relevant. Um, uh, I also think one of the other big big lessons is make sure that when you're coming to planning, you've got a clear planning team that doesn't have its hands full doing other things. I think one of the issues with the planning for Sicily is that all the senior commanders have got their hands full with fighting a campaign, a pretty tough and rigorous campaign in Tunisia rather than focusing, focusing solely on the operation in hand, the operation to come rather, which is obviously Husky. And that's a lesson obviously they take forward when it comes to Normandy, so that everyone's moved out of the Italian theater at the end of 1943 and said, okay, right, we're gonna be moving into, into, uh, into Normandy in May and then subsequently June, 1944, you've got five, then six months to kind of get yourself sorted with a clear head and nothing else on in your kind of intro. Normandy was prepared with a great amount of deception and misleading information. Uh, what about Sicily from both the Allies side and the German side in terms of deception or misinformation? They don't have anything like the intelligence picture that they do for, for, Normand uh, for Normandy. Uh, um, you know, all the time that the uh, that Operation Husky is being planned, and uh, I just remind you that it's uh, the planning is signed off on the 2nd of May, so 11 days before the completion of the Tunisia campaign. They're planning for a campaign when you have absolutely no idea at all what the strength of the Axis forces is going to be on Sicily. So that's quite hard. Whereas obviously in the run up to um, Normandy, the Allies have a very clear idea of what the German forces and what the German strength is on, on Normandy and the whole of um, Northwest Europe. Um, so that's that's different for starters. The truth of the matter is you've suddenly got a very, very sizable allied armed forces in the Mediterranean, and it would be insane not to use them. Uh, and and the Axis forces, both the Italians and the Germans, both recognize that that a, a subsequent allied operation in the Mediterranean is incredibly likely. And that means going into southern Europe. Now, the choices really are Greece and the Balkans, 
Sardinia, which is kind of sort of a bit north, uh, kind of west of, of Sicily and Sicily itself. Now, Hitler tends to kind of view the world through the prism of his own thought processes. So for him, the, the, the bit that he values the most is Ploesti, the Balkans, Greece. You know, that's for him his most precious part of the Mediterranean southern flank. Therefore, that is where the Allies are going to land, because that's how he thinks. So the deception plan is to kind of stage it and try and get the Germans to think that perhaps they're going to land on Sardinia first as a stepping stone to going into Greece. As a deception plan, it has a little bit of merit because it's kind of in tune with what Hitler is already thinking. But from a practical point of view, it makes no sense whatsoever. Because even Hitler, if he casts his mind back to 1940, recognises that he cannot do a cross-channel invasion of Great Britain unless he has control of the skies over the invasion front. And to do that, you have to have fighter aircraft to support your bombers uh, and to protect your ships and to see off enemy, you know, your enemy's fighter planes. And that means that wherever you land has to be within range of fighter aircraft. Now, Sardinia, it's just about possible, but not really. Greece, it's certainly not possible. It's just too far away. So you can't provide fighter cover in Greece. So anyone with any med uh, military sense would have appreciated that Greece is simply not where the Allies are going to land and that it's extremely unlikely that the Allies are going to land in Sardinia. I mean, why would you when you could land in, in Sicily? And so Mussolini... Kesselring, Field Marshal Kesselring, who is the overall German commander in, in the Mediterranean, uh, um, General von Senger and Uttlin, who is the German liaison officer to the Italians, um, General Roatza, who is the uh, Italian commander on Sicily, etc., etc. They all think that the Allies are going to land on Sicily because that is basically, realistically, the only place they can properly land with guaranteed air cover. And so it proves to be. Now, the British get terribly carried away with their deception plans. And um, uh, some of you may have seen the film, The Kind of Man with No Name and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, and there was this amazing deception plan to get a down and out who'd, who'd killed himself with rat poison um, and dress him up in the uh, in the uniform of a of a British, um, of a Royal Navy Marine commando and put him in uniform with some fake plans that the British are going to land in Sardinia as a stepping stone to going into, into the Balkans and Greece. There were a whole load of other deception plans going on in Greece, incidentally, as well. Some 43 sabotage operations in southern Greece. Uh, and then released this poor um, poor dead individual into the Mediterranean so he'd wash up on the shore on fr uh, in Spain as though he'd come down in a, in a shot down plane or a plane that, that had been fallen into the sea. Uh, they would then discover his papers and pass uh, the Spanish, you know, the uh, fascist Franco -Span Spanish would then pass that on to German intelligence services and it would eventually wind its way to Hitler. And so it came to pass. This is exactly what happened. But all that did was confirm what Hitler already thought and did nothing to dissuade what everyone else who thought it was going to be Sicily uh, um, from thinking it was going to be Sicily. So, in other words, it was a complete waste of time. So we're going to take the last question right now. And uh, the last question is the strategic impact on Overlord. Uh, did Sicily anyway delay the planning or was it a test run? Yeah, Sicily doesn't delay the planning for, for, for Operation Overlord at all. It, it is a test run. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole series of areas where um, Sicily is a very important one. I mean, if you think about, about Operation Overlord, it is absolutely gargantuan. And while actually more men were landed on D-Day on Operation Husky, 160,000 compared to 150,000 um, uh, in Normandy, um, 11 months later, Normandy is obviously a considerably greater operation, not least because there's nearly 7,000 vessels involved, where there's only kind of 2,600 involved with Husky. But but if you're going to do a um, um, an operation such as Operation Overlord, um, the invasion of Normandy, you really need to have a dress rehearsal beforehand. You need to know that your systems are in place, that it can be done. And actually, Operation Husky is incredibly challenging because rather than crossing a, a stretch of sea of kind of 70 to 80, 90 miles, you're crossing a stretch of sea which is hundreds of miles, you know, from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. You know, it's a huge, huge undertaking. And especially since British and American troops um, haven't been operating together on the ground before, um, before really 
before November 1942. So, you know, less than a year before, nine months before. So it's really important that you do this. It's also important that you kind of test all your logistics, that you test your supply chain, that you test your planning operations, and, and that you learn from things that inevitably aren't going to go quite as well as they might. Um, you know, I've already touched on the planning. It's important that you understand that one understands that, that you know, planners need to be planning and nothing else. You know, they need to be focusing on training their troops, getting everyone ready for this, this monstrous undertaking, rather than kind of trying to fight another campaign at the same time as preparing for the next. So that's one important lesson. The other really big important lesson, of course, is about the special forces. And I'm talking about the airborne operations, which are frankly a fiasco. I mean, the British indulge in a, in a glider borne operation, which involves 147 gliders, of which a mere four land on their correct landing zones. Now, that is not great. 69 of them end up in the sea. I mean, it is an absolute fiasco. Then you've got the um, the uh, paratroop operations. You know, you've got the 505th uh, um, um, Parachute Combat Team um, commanded by by uh, um, Colonel Gavin, then Colonel Gavin, Jim Gavin. Um, and, you know, and they're scattered to the four winds. I mean, from, I think it's kind of three and a half thousand men, I think barely 200 land where they're supposed to land, you know, on D-Day. So, uh, and this is D-Day first, Sicily, incidentally. So that's not great. Then there is the following day when, a, when a, a second lift is dropped in and they'll get shot at by the, by the Navy. You know, this is, these are important lessons. And one of the big problems you have with the airborne operation is that by 1943, you've got these airborne troops who are supremely well-trained, highly motivated, all volunteers. They're there because they want to be. You know, they are what we would call today special forces, I suppose. Um, and yet they're being delivered to the combat zone by the least trained air crew. Um, and, and of course, there are some exceptional transport command, um, <coughs> transport carrier command uh, uh, pilots and navigators and so on. But by and large, as a rule of thumb, they're not that, you know, your, your first intake goes to fighters and bombers, um, not flying C-47s. So that's a problem. And, and there is other, there's also just a complete lack of coordination. So your paratroopers might be trained to within an inch of their life uh, being paratroopers, but they're not trained at operating with the transport command who are going to be delivering to the combat zone. And that's just not good enough. That, that, that is just an insane waste of a really, really precious resource. And to be honest, it's not it's still not completely sorted out by, by D-Day, but it's much improved, it has to be said. And I think for all the kind of talk of the scattering of D-Day, in actual fact, 50% are, 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 of US um, airborne troops are deposited within, uh, um, uh, within five miles of, of their, their combat zone. And I think it's something like nearing 50% are within two miles and 75% are within, within 10 miles. So, you know, that's not bad, really. I mean, the big scheme of things. So those are the big, big lessons, really, I think. But I think you need this. You can't just do it. You can't just do it, uh, an operation of the scale of Normandy um, completely blind. And of course, following that, you've then got southern Italy and Salerno and, and, and Anzio and so on. And um, so there are other operations in between, all of which are vital, vital testing grounds for Normandy. Well, thank you very much, General Swan. Yeah, well, gentlemen, thank you very much, uh, James, for a great talk and for a great book. Uh, before we close, let, let me just ask you quickly, what, what's your next project that you're working on? Well, I'm supposed to be doing the third volume of my, uh, my what I've been calling the kind of War in the West trilogy. But sadly, because of COVID, I can't get the, uh, the archives yeah. I need to do. So actually, I'm doing a kind of sort of band of brothers, but with a, with a tank unit. Uh, following them from um, from D Day to VE Day, and it's a it's it's a it's a unit that I know very well, and I've interviewed a number of the veterans, and um, they uh, managed to leave a very large number of of diaries and letters and and memoirs and so on. So uh, I'm trying to get the reader as close as it's possible to get to what it was like operating in a frontline um, independent armored brigade um, from D Day to VE Day. Um, in 1944, wow. 1945, wow. and it's and it's uh, I I can't even begin to tell you how much I'm loving it. It's just I, I can't wait. Fascinating. Can't wait to see it as a as a career armor officer myself. Oh, I look well, forward to that. Much. So thank you, James and Ted. Thank you, uh, General Stroop. Pre appreciate all you do for the association and for moderating today, both of you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.
Uh, before uh, we depart today, I wanted to uh, bring you all up to speed on some upcoming events here at AUSA. Uh, next Tuesday, the 24th of November, we'll host another uh, AUSA Thought Leaders webinar featuring General Thierry Burkhardt, the Chief of Staff of the French Army, and Major General Michel de Leon, who is the head of the French Army's Doctrine and Staff College Command. Uh, they'll be discussing a new strategic vision that's just been published for the French Army, uh, clearly one of our uh, major NATO allies. So that's next Tuesday, 24 November. On the 2nd of December, our next AUSA noon report will feature Command Sergeant Major John Sampa. Uh, Sergeant Major Sampa is the Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard. And then on the 4th of December, you won't want to miss our next Thought Leaders webinar with former National Security Advisor, uh, Lieutenant General Retired H.R. McMaster, who will be discussing his new book entitled Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. These are just some of the great speakers we have lined up for you in the coming weeks and months. And uh, if you need more information, want more information, or to register for these events, go to the AUSA website at ausa.org. And then finally, we want to thank uh, all of you who support AUSA with your membership. Uh, frankly, membership really does matter. And uh, you help us support America's Army, actually your Army. And frankly, we can't do it without your membership. So again, go to the AUSA website, ausa.org, to join, to renew, or just to update your, your membership information when you have an opportunity. So gentlemen, thanks again, and to our audience, thanks for joining us, and have a great Army Day.